All right, so this morning we are going to finish up our series uh, entitled Characters 2.0. Uh, for the last uh, few weeks, we've been looking at some of the background characters um, of the New Testament. Uh, we've looked at, at Joseph, the father of Jesus, um, you know, and how he was just this, this good man, uh, just a, a worker um, who became the father of the Son of God while he was here on this earth. Uh, we looked at, at Matthew, this man who was a, a tax collector who was uh, supposed to do great things in his life, uh, but ended up following the wrong path. But then Jesus came and restored him and redeemed him back to where he needed to be. Uh, we looked at Timothy, this half Jew, half Greek, um, who really had no business being in, in the family of God or working for the kingdom, who eventually came to be one of the greatest church leaders um, in, in the whole world. Uh, last week we looked at the bad guys that kind of led into the crucifixion and played a part in Jesus being killed. Uh, but this morning we're going to close out this series with a dynamic duo. Um, this morning we're going to highlight a married couple who did everything that they could to further the kingdom of God um, where they were. That no matter where they went, um, they were going to work for the kingdom. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at the lives and the kingdom work of Aquila and Priscilla uh, from the New Testament. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla were a man and wife who, who were both workers for the kingdom. They were people who worked closely with the Apostle Paul. Um, they were ones that led churches and no matter where they were. They were two people who were all in for the kingdom of God, no matter where they were or no matter what happened to them. And so let's look at this first piece of scripture where we first meet Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, this is from the 18th chapter of, of Acts, and Paul's currently at the end of his second missionary journey. He comes into Corinth, um, which is a big shipping city, on his way back home to Antioch, and this is where he meets uh, these two. This is from Acts 18, 1 through 4. It says, Now after Paul left Athens, he went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently coming from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. And he went to see them because he was of the same trade and he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in a synagogue every Sabbath and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So, so here from this passage, we meet Aquila and Priscilla, these, these two people, this, this married couple, and, and Paul automatically um, is just joined with them. Uh, and we learn so much um, from just this passage, just from these four verses, we learn so much. Uh, we can see that Aquila was a Jew, originally a Jew by birth, from Pontus, which was a Roman province, uh, which is in modern-day Turkey, basically due north of Jerusalem uh, a good long way. Um, and we can assume that he was a free man because most Jews living in Roman provinces were, um, and he was moving around uh, freely. Um, now, we don't know much about Priscilla uh, uh, from this. We don't know much about Priscilla's uh, background, but we can assume that she was not a Jew uh, because when Luke was writing these things, he was very thorough. And if Priscilla was a Jew, he would have said, you know, she was a Jew who became a follower, um, and, and that's how this happened. But, but no, he just says his wife, uh, Priscilla. Uh, now, the name Priscilla is a common Roman name um, that was given among the aristocratic family, so more than likely she was a Roman from Rome who was very well off. Um, yet what we see here is she's married a Jew who's living in a Roman province, um, and they eventually become believers. Uh, now, we don't know whether, you know, she converted to Judaism uh, to marry uh, Aquila, and then they both converted to Christianity together, or she met him after he had converted to Christianity and then became a Christian. But what we do know is they both ended up followers of Christ and then now ministry partners of Paul. Um, you know, how they became followers uh, of Christ is kind of a, a mystery of its own. It doesn't say, you know, how he became a, a Christian and how she became a Christian, but it's, it's interesting to kind of stop and to think about. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, Aquila was a Jew that was living in Pontus, which was a, uh, a Roman province, like I said, modern day Turkey. And, and all Jews, no matter where they were living, were called to go back to Jerusalem three times a year and make the pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to celebrate the three major holidays in Judaism. So uh, a lot of biblical scholars think that maybe Aquila had come down from Pontus to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when Peter and the rest of the disciples um, were given the Holy Spirit. He heard Peter preaching right then and there and then went back to Pontus a Christian. 
Um, there's also a possibility that um, Aquila was living in Rome um, and, and the kind of the same thing that, you know, he had to come back um, to Jerusalem for this, uh, for Pentecost and heard the preaching that way. Um, you know, verse uh, nine in chapter two of the book of Acts, when it's talking about um, Peter giving this wonderful sermon, it says that there were disciples there. There were people there from the, the province of uh, Pontus and there were people there from Rome. So, I mean, there could be either one of those possibilities. Um, there's a possibility that the Apostle Peter um, preached to, directly to uh, Aquila when he was in Pontus around 40 AD because in 1 Peter chapter 1, we see that Peter took a missionary journey there. There's another possibility that Aquila heard the good news from Peter when Peter was in Rome in 42 AD before uh, all the Jews were kicked out of Rome by Claudius. Um, and then obviously the, another possibility that he came to faith through the testimony of any of the uh, any people at one of those events. But it's fascinating to think all of the possibilities of how Aquila and Priscilla came into their faith. The Bible doesn't tell us, you know, but we can kind of uh, think about it. Um, it's also fascinating to think about the possible movement of Aquila and Priscilla as, as a result of their coming to faith. You know, we don't know when Aquila and Priscilla uh, met. You know, it could have been that, that Peter came upon us and preached and Aquila came to faith and he went back to Rome uh, with Peter um, and that's where he met Priscilla and then she came to faith and then they were married and then they were this ministry couple uh, from there. We really don't know, but, but we know that God perfectly orchestrated their lives and perfectly orchestrated their movements so that they could be where they needed to be so that they could do work for the kingdom of God. Another thing that we learn for sure from this first passage is that they shared a trade uh, with Paul. And, and this is such a cool detail that Luke puts in there because we don't really think about the Apostle Paul, you know, needing a job. We don't think about the Apostle Paul being a worker. We think about him just being a traveling preacher who went throughout the entire known world. Uh, but, but he had this job that he was a tent maker. And it said that Aquila and Priscilla shared that trade. And, and that's why they got along so well and that he stayed with them so that they could work uh, together. Uh, now, when we think of tent makers, we think of like, you know, the old Coleman four-man tent that we go camping with. And, you know, it's got the zippers and that kind of stuff. But it was so much uh, more than that. Uh, tent making in the first century, they were like building awnings, um, making sails for ships. And that was really important because they were in Corinth, uh, which it was one of the biggest shipping ports in the entire world. So they were there mending sails and making sails. Um, and that's a big thing for Aquila and Priscilla. A ton of work and a ton of opportunities for evangelism. So Paul's there in Corinth and he's making tents and sails and awnings and all that kind of stuff with Aquila and Priscilla and he's going to the synagogue every day uh, reasoning with people and sharing the good news of the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, Paul stays in Corinth for a year and a half during this time. During, during this time, a year and a half, 18 months, Paul is there with Aquila and Priscilla. And he also had Timothy and Silas with him. So we have in the city of Corinth, one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire, five huge followers of Christ who were all in for the kingdom of God. They're doing everything that they could to preach and teach. A year and a half, a ton of ministering to the people in Corinth. Uh, but it was finally time for Paul to move on. So Paul takes his entire team and they go to Ephesus. Here's 18 verses 18 through 21. It says, after this, Paul stayed many days longer. And then he took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Chantria, he had to cut all of his hair for he was under a vow. And then he came to Ephesus and he left them there. But he himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a little longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And then he set sail from Ephesus. So Paul says, look, it's time for us to go. We've been in Corinth for a year and a half now. We've done some great work, but it's time to move on. So he takes his entire ministry team. He takes Paul, and Paul takes Timothy and Silas and Aquila and Priscilla, and they go into Ephesus, which is, which is an even greater city uh, than Corinth. I mean, this, uh, the, the city of Ephesus was like the trading route of all trading routes. It was the fourth largest city in the entire Roman Empire, and this is where they go. And obviously, this is good for Aquila and Priscilla as people who are making sales for ships. Um, they're going to have a ton of work and a ton of opportunities to share the good news. But they go to Ephesus. Paul hangs out with them for a little while. And then he goes on and he heads back down to Jerusalem. Uh, but he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there. 
And it's during those years that they start this house church. Um, and it's, it's an amazing thing. And it's an amazing time of ministering to the needs of the people and spreading the news of Christ. During Paul's third missionary journey, he comes back and he stays in Ephesus for three years. And it's during those three years that he stays at the home of Aquila and Priscilla. They were so close to the Apostle Paul at that time. Uh, in fact, when Paul was staying in their house, while Paul was staying in Ephesus for those three years, that's when he wrote um, his first letter to the church in Corinth. So 1 Corinthians was written more than likely from the house of Aquila and Priscilla. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 19 through 24. It says, the churches of Asia send their greetings to you. Aquila and Prisca, who's Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. And all of the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Oh, our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Paul says, look, you know, Aquila and Priscilla are sending their greetings to you, to this church in Corinth. Now, now remember, where were Aquila and Priscilla right before they went to Ephesus? They were in Corinth. So they were in Corinth for 18 months with Paul building up the church in Corinth. And then now they're in Ephesus and Paul is staying in their house in Ephesus. And he writes this letter to Corinth and he says, Aquila and Priscilla are greeting you. And the whole, this house church that they have, they are sending a hearty greeting to you in the Lord. I mean, how awesome is that that we get to see, you know, Paul's heart here. We see um, the, the love and the hospitality of Aquila and Priscilla for not only Paul, but for the kingdom. And they did great work in the city of Ephesus. And it was, it was in their time of Ephesus where they meet another man that would end up being a huge worker for the kingdom of God and a man that they would have influence over. This is from 18, 24 through 28. It says, now a Jew named Apollos a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace and believed, for he had powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So here we see this guy named Apollos show up in Ephesus, and he shows up in the synagogue, and it says he's an eloquent man who was well-versed in scriptures, and he gets up and he starts preaching and teaching in the synagogue. So Aquila and Priscilla, of course, they're there. They go out and they want to hear what this guy's got to say. And, and obviously they come and they, you know, hear this wonderful speaker, someone who's very eloquent. But then they start to realize that the things that he's preaching are not fully complete. They realize that he's kind of missing a few pieces of the puzzle. Now, obviously, when they heard him, they would have known that his heart was good. They would have known that his motivations were clear. They would have known that he was a good man just trying to do well, that he just didn't have uh, uh, the full picture. So they go over to Apollos and they're like, hey, we need to talk to you about what's going on here. And it literally says that they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I mean, can you just imagine how that conversation went? They probably said, hey, look, we've been hanging out with Paul for the last like four and a half years, okay? The Apostle Paul, the same one who went to Jerusalem, who talked to the disciples that walked with Jesus, and we know that his gospel is truth. We know that the things that he taught uh, were backed up by the apostles and that came straight from Jesus. So this is what we need you to know. And they filled him in on everything that he was missing. And not only did they do that, when it was time for him to go and keep spreading the good news, they encouraged him, they built him up, and then they sent him on his way with letters so that he could walk into churches and say, Aquila and Priscilla have sent me and they're vouching for me. It's a wonderful thing. And all of a sudden, he starts doing great work throughout the entire region. 
At some point, he comes to Corinth, and he does such a great job in Corinth and preaches such a wonderful job in Corinth that uh, they start accrediting their faith to, uh, to Apollo. Some of them do. This is from Paul's first letter, uh, 1 Corinthians 1. It says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is some quarreling among you, my brothers. What does it mean that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, who is Peter, or I follow Christ? He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? But how crazy is it that Apollos had become such a great leader of the church and a great minister in the church that he's mentioned with Paul and Peter? I mean, if you were making a Mount Rushmore of, of uh, apostles, Paul and Peter would be up there and the other two sp spots would be empty. Yet here we see the church in Corinth, they're following Paul or they're following Peter or they're following Apollos. And that's all because Aquila and Priscilla gently and lovingly corrected him and then built him up and encouraged him and sent him on his way. Uh, and that's not the only place we see Paul's. Paul is even more bold in the next couple chapters uh, later on from 1 Corinthians 3. It says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you're still in the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh of behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another one says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants for whom you believe? The Lord assigned to teach? I planted Apollos' water, but God gave the growth, so neither he who plants nor he who waters does anything or is anything, but only God who gives growth. He's like, he's like, look, you guys want to follow Apollos or you want to follow me, Paul, or you want to follow Peter. And he's like, you don't need to follow all these people. You need to follow God. He's like, I came and I planted the seeds of the gospel in this community. I planted the seeds of the gospel in this church, but it's Apollos that came and watered it, but it's God that created the growth. And it isn't a wonderful thing to see, you know, that when we look at Apollos and his life, who was it that watered him? Who was it that tended to the earth around him? This analogy of planting and watering, it was Aquila and Priscilla taking care of him and building him up and pouring into him to where he had such great Aquila and Priscilla spent a good deal of time in Ephesus, but uh, after a good time, it was time for them to return home. Uh, the next time we see them, they were in uh, Rome, and, and guess what they're doing when they're in Rome? They're running a house church. They're running a church. Here's Paul's letter to the church in Rome, uh, Romans 16, 1 through 5. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at the Centuria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her with whatever she may need from you, for she's a patron of many and myself as well. Greet Prisca, Priscilla, and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all of the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church that is in their home. Greet my beloved of Pamphinus and the first convert of Christ in Asia. Paul tells the, the Roman church, hey, I need you to tell hi to Aquila and Priscilla. He said, I need you to tell hi to these great people and say hello to the church that they are running there. Uh, the cool thing about this uh, that we don't get when we read that is that word greet um, that Paul used in the Greek gives connotations of giving a bear hug. He is literally telling him, I need you to go and give a bear hug to these two people because they mean that much to me. He says they risked their neck for me and they risked their neck for the kingdom of God. We don't know what it was that they did, uh, but with everything that we know about them so far, it's not surprising. They're fellow workers, they're fellow servants for the kingdom of God, willing to risk it all. And now that they have moved back to Rome, they have started this church again. Just like they did in Corinth, they started a church. Just like they did in Ephesus, they started a church. Aquila and Priscilla coming home to Rome would have been after 54 AD, after Claudius, the emperor of Rome, died. Um, and they would have been there about 10 years uh, before they were kicked out again. But in those 10 years, they would have done great work. 
And when Paul takes um, his, his journey to Rome and he's shipwrecked in Malta, that would have been around 58 AD, and, and he stayed there for about two years, and Aquila and Priscilla were in Rome during that time. And the book of Acts tells us that the apostle Paul was allowed to go and visit people, and he was allowed to have visitors come, and you can bet and believe it that they were there with him, visiting with him and ministering to him without the shadow of a doubt. But unfortunately, Aquila and Priscilla uh, couldn't stay in Rome too much longer. Uh, in the year 64 AD, the city of Rome uh, burned to the ground and Nero, the evil emperor uh, of Rome, blamed Christians on doing it and it was time for Aquila and Priscilla to get out of Dodge. Um, now, we don't know whether their home or their business uh, was destroyed. Uh, church tradition says that the house church that they had was on the Aventine Hill um, area in Rome, and, and that portion of the city was burned to the ground uh, completely. So more than likely, Aquila and Priscilla would have lost everything in that great fire of Rome, and, and they fled all the way back to Ephesus, uh, probably with just the shirts on their back. We see in Paul's letter to Timothy um, that our power couple um, is now there in Ephesus. Uh, this is from 2 Timothy 4. It says, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophius, who was ill, and Miletus. Do your best to come before where Eubulus and sends his greeting to you, as, as does Prudence, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So Paul is writing this to Timothy, and while he was leading the church at Ephesus, Paul, Paul is sending his, his love to Timothy, and he sends his love to Aquila and Priscilla there. Again, that word Greek that Paul uses is to give them a bear hug. Now notice what Paul doesn't mention here. He doesn't say that they have a church there. More than likely, if Aquila and Priscilla had lost everything in, in Rome and they probably just escaped with the shirts on their back, they were probably coming to Ephesus just to be ministered to. And this church in Ephesus was one that was already built up, it was one that was already grown at this point. Uh, Timothy was there, a great follower of Paul. Uh, the apostle John was there, uh, one of the followers of Jesus. Um, and, and Aquila and Priscilla were just coming to, to rest and to, and to be ministered to, to be taken care of, to be lifted up, to be encouraged. Man, when you step back and you look at their life and you look at, at this married couple and their dedication and their devotion to the kingdom of God, it is simply amazing. You've got this Jewish guy who lives in Pontus, a Roman province way up north of Israel, and he goes to Rome and meets an aristocratic woman, and they get married, and they become followers of Christ, and then they have to leave Rome, and they go to Corinth, and while they're in Corinth, they meet this guy named Paul, this missionary, and they, and they become followers of his, and they do worship, uh, and they, they do ministry with him, and they do missions with him, and then they go over to Ephesus, and they, they do all this time, they spend all this time in Ephesus, and they, they meet this guy named Apollo, and they build him up, and he goes on to be a great church leader, and then they finally get back to Rome and then uh, after doing great work there, building this great church there, they go after a decade and then they have to leave again because they've lost everything and yet here they are in the church again. I mean, unbelievable. What a life. I mean, what a life, you know, and this was at a time in history where people didn't move around. You generally, uh, you know, you were born in a place and you died in that same exact place. What a life. And there are so many things that we can learn from this amazing couple. I mean, so many things that we, so many things more that we could hit just in this morning. I mean, the fact that, that they work with Apollos and their simple correction and their love and their encouragement and their lifting him up did great things for the kingdom. And how just little things of helping people and building them up can have a snowball effect for the kingdom. We can talk about God's province and how he made all these things work together uh, for his good, for his kingdom, for his will. Uh, we can talk about how the, these two got married um, and, and met Paul and they were in this perfect place to minister to people. And we can see God working through all of this. But there are three aspects of these two characters that we need to pull away and that we need to apply to our lives. First and foremost, Aquila and Priscilla are the perfect example of a kingdom-driven marriage. This is what a marriage should look like. This is what a kingdom-driven marriage looks like. This is what we should all, every single one of us who are married, should be striving for. This is what we should be aspiring for. Aquila and Priscilla were not just a married couple who happened to be Christians. 
Aquila and Priscilla were not a married couple who just happened to go to church. Aquila and Priscilla were not just a married couple who just happened to meet this guy named Paul. No, Aquila and Priscilla dedicated their lives and their marriage to working for the kingdom of God. And no matter what they did in their marriage, they were going to go and do everything that they could so that every last person would hear the good news and every last person would know that God loves them. They spent their entire marriage going from city to city to city. And the first thing they would do when they would get there is they would start a house church and bring people together so that they could worship together, so that they could grow together, so that they could learn the scriptures more accurately, and so that they could experience the saving grace of Jesus. That was the main goal of their marriage. They were partners for the kingdom of God. They were partners for the church. They were partners for the sake and the cause of Christ. They were teammates in it all for the cause. And that should be the goal and motivation for every single one of us. Every single marriage. We shouldn't just be couples that go uh, to church or couples that are just Christians. We should be partner, partners for the kingdom. Next thing that we pull from Aquila and Priscilla is that no matter the circumstances or where God places us, we need to be working for him. We need to be working for him. Aquila and Priscilla were all over the place. I mean, they moved and moved and moved and moved again. They moved all over the place. But they didn't let that deter them from the work of God. They didn't let that stop them from doing this great work. It's not like they were living in Corinth and they started this great house church and then they had to leave and go to Ephesus and they were like, well, we already built a church. We're not going to do it again. No, as soon as they get to Ephesus, they're like, we're going to build this church up. We're going to build a house church. And then they finally get to go back to Rome. It wasn't like, well, now we're back in Rome. We'll just settle back into our old lives. We'll make our tents. We'll make our awnings. We'll make our sales. And then we don't have to do anything else. We've already started two churches. We don't need to start anymore. No, they said the first thing we got to do is set up a church. The working for the kingdom. They didn't let these circumstances lead them away from the work of God. They didn't let these circumstances and these moves of being all over the place detract them from the kingdom of God. No matter where they were, they were working for the kingdom. And that takes us to the last thing that we need to apply from their lives and apply to our lives. So the kingdom of God should be our number one, our main focus. The kingdom of God should be our number one. It should be our main focus. Aquila and Priscilla were all in for the kingdom. It was the most important thing in their lives. It was their main motivation for everything. It was the kingdom of God. They traveled the world. They left Pontus to go to Rome, Rome to Corinth, Corinth to Ephesus, Ephesus back to Rome, Rome to, to Ephesus. And in each and every single one, they were looking for ways to further the kingdom. It was the driving force of their marriage. It was the driving force of their business life. It was the driving force of every single thing that they did. And it should be the same for us. It should be the same for anyone who has claimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Every single day that we walk, walk through this life should be for the kingdom of God. Our marriages should be dedicated for the kingdom of God. The way that we parent should be for the kingdom of God. The way that we go to work should be for the kingdom of God. The way that we live in our community should be for the kingdom of God. The way that we treat our friends at school and go through the hallways in school should be for the kingdom of God. All in, all of the time, in every single aspect of life. Quill and Priscilla are great examples for each and every one of these three pieces of our lives for, for our marriage and for being all in. You know, in this series, we've looked at some great characters. You know, other than the bad guys that we looked at last week, you know, we looked at Joseph and Matthew and Timothy and now Aquil and Priscilla. And, and each of these characters have one thing in common. They all have one thing in common, and that was that they were all in for God. They were all in for Jesus. 
The reason that these guys and, 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 and gal, the reason that they were all in the Bible was because they were all in for God and they were all in for Jesus and they were all in for the kingdom of God. That's why they were in there. That's why the, these biblical writers added them in there because they made contributions to the kingdom of God. They were all in for God. They were all in for Christ. And that's why we see them in the account. So that leads us to this question. If someone was writing a book or a story or a letter, about the church in the 21st century in southern Indiana, would you be in that book? If there was a written account of the church in this area, would your name appear anywhere in that book? Would your name appear anywhere in that account? Would you be a character, even a small background character in that at all? Would your name be in there? Are you living a life that would warrant and mention in that book? Are you all in? Are you working in such a way that you'd be in that book? Are you upstanding in the community and devout in your faith like Joseph was? Are you a great example of redemption like Matthew showing that your life is one that has been saved by God's grace through Christ's sacrifice? Are you living free of the bondage of the sin that used to hold you? Are you like Timothy, not letting where you came from or, or how you were raised or where you grew up affect what you can do for the kingdom of God? Are you like Aquila and Priscilla that no matter where God places you or the circumstances that you face, that you are going to work tirelessly for the kingdom of God and to spread the good news and the gospel of Jesus? If someone was writing an account of the church in southern Indiana in the year 2023, would you be in it? Now, obviously, we don't follow Christ and work for the kingdom just so we can be mentioned in the book, so we can receive glory. Aquila and Priscilla didn't do all this so that Paul and Luke would write about him. Matthew didn't follow Jesus so he could get the credit. Timothy didn't become a disciple of Paul for the glory. But our lives should be led in such a way that people see us and see us as followers and see that something is different. We should be living in such a way that people see us and they know that we are all in for the cause of Christ. We should be living our lives in such a way that if we're someone to write an account of the church, that there would be no way that they could possibly leave us out. That there's no way that they could complete the narrative without putting in something about us. We should be such a force for the kingdom of God and for the gospel of Jesus Christ that if someone wrote about it, that they would have to talk about us both as individuals and as a church. But is that the case? Is that how it is? Would they write about you? Would they write about me? Would they write about us? So here's the deal. If you're living your life and you're not living in such a way that you're building the kingdom every single day, then you need to make some serious adjustments. If you're living your life and it doesn't point to Jesus, then you need to make some serious adjustments. If you're living your life and people can't tell that you're all in for the kingdom of God, then you need to make some serious adjustments. If you're living your life and you, in such a way that you wouldn't even be mentioned in an account of the church, then you have some serious adjustments to make. And that all starts with a commitment and dedication to Christ and for the work for the kingdom. So this morning, as we close this service, we take a moment with God and we commit ourselves to living for the kingdom every single day and living a life that is all in for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we pray that you will please forgive us for the times where we haven't lived a life worthy of you where we haven't lived a life uh, that would be mentioned, where we haven't lived a life uh, that points to you. And God, we're so thankful that we can see Aquila and Priscilla and, and all these other characters and, and see how they work for the kingdom so that they can be great examples for us. God, I pray that you can be with us as we further in, in our lives so that we can be people who are fully dedicated to you, fully all in for you, seeking the kingdom above all and working with everything that we have for you and for your cause. 
God, we love you and we are yours. We pray that as we go through this world that we thrive in you. We love you and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>